Hello, everyone. Welcome to Physics 105. Um, today, we will talk about um, Newton's equations of motions. So to start, I want to uh, make a little bit advertisement because Isaac Newton is uh, I think my favorite physicist. And um, in the history of science, I think I'm having a hard time to find anybody anywhere close to him. And um, actually, if you really push me, maybe I can find one or two. Even these two people will not be anywhere close. Newton is in terms of what he did. So um, today, actually, you'll uh, so you already know it, but we will talk about uh, Isaac Newton's masterpiece, uh, his equations of motion, or like his laws of motion. And these are uh, important, not only in physics, but I think in the entire science. So every day, if you look around how apples fall, for example, obeys Newton's laws, how cars move, obeys Newton's laws. If you look at the sky, the moon obeys Newton's laws. The sun, our entire um, solar system obeys Newton's laws. Galaxies, entire universe runs by Newton's laws. And in the, if you go in the opposite direction, like uh, if you go to molecules and atoms, they also obey Newton's laws. If you go to electrons, they obey Newton's laws. So it is really powerful and it is really hard to find anything like this that describes nature so well. And yet I think it is so simple and easy to understand. We teach this in high schools. That's how um, great a topic this is. And so, uh, just to advertise, when we start talking about this, we may be, you may find yourself talking about like boxes, inclined planes, or like, a, I don't know, it may look like a toy to you. Please remember that this is just like an exercise for you to test your understanding and um, just take it seriously and try to see what is beyond that simple exam. Also, you guys are mechanical engineers, so I'm pretty sure, you know, you will not be able to successful without mastering Newton's equations. And I challenge you to find anyone like Newton in your entire career in terms of what he found. So, okay, without further ado, let's start. Here we are in chapter four. And we are now moving on topics of dynamics and you'll talk about Newton's laws of motion. And please go ahead and read these chapters and they're actually easy to read. There are a lot of solved examples. If you want to polish your, um, polish your uh, high school knowledge. And here are the suggested problems I'll try to solve some of So I advertise Newton's laws. Um, and the, for this, we need to introduce some concepts that we didn't have in the previous weeks. And the first one is the concept of force. So to be able to talk about force, I actually uh, separated two kinds of forces. And the first one is contact forces. And these are the kind of forces you see every day. Like if you push a door, there's a contact force. If you hit a key in your keyboard, there's a contact force. If you look outside and see the wind on the trees, there's a contact force. They basically stem from um, touch of two objects and one object, object um, gives motion to another one. But these are not the only kind of forces. They are also, just to give an example, we have also forces acting at a distance. So the best example is gravitational force. So even if you are not in contact with Earth, if you are like in the air, if you jumped, Earth still pulls you and you still feel the force. 
And there are other forces like this. For example, electromagnetic force is a force acting at a distance. And there are other special forces I think you'll never see in physics, like a, we call in the nuclear realm, they are like weak and strong forces. They also act at a distance. So the important thing to know is force is a vector quantity, which means it has a magnitude and a direction. Okay. Now, if we have the concept of force, I think we can introduce Newton's first law of motion. And it is actually very simple. And it is, uh, I think a little bit related to Galileo's uh, statement we had um, last week. It goes like this. Every object stays in its state of rest or motion with constant velocity if and only if there is no force acting on it. So it basically says that if there is no force, you either are at rest or you go with constant velocity. Okay. So here let's, um, Let's, for example, think about this uh, example from your book I just cut. So a school bus comes to a sudden stop and all of the backpacks on the floor starts to slide forward. What forces causes them to do that? Okay, maybe I can wait for a few people to write a few speculations. Mm -hmm. So when you are in a bus, of course, it's been a while, maybe you didn't, momentum, yes. If somebody says momentum, any other guesses? Is there any forces? There is no force, okay? Then when the bus stops, what happens? Why do we feel that um, kick towards they want to maintain their velocity. Okay, they want to maintain velocity, but why? What, what do we call this? Why do they want to maintain velocity? Yes, somebody actually said inertia. I think, yeah, I know you guys know it, but it doesn't hurt to sometimes talk about this. It is, of course, inertia. So when you are in a bus and moving with constant velocity, you want to preserve that state of motion. And when, you, when the driver stops suddenly, the bus stops, but you move, so you want to keep moving. So we call this inertia. And why did I uh, want? So an inertial reference frame is a frame that has no acceleration. And as a result, there is no force. So in this reference frame, Newton's first law holds. Okay, it's persistent people. Um, for example, a reference frame that is at rest is of course inertial, but also a reference frame that moves with constant velocity is also an inertial reference frame. So here's another question for you. Suppose you are in a frame, and suppose you are in a frame, and you want to um, find out if this frame is inertial. What would you do? How can you verify if a reference frame is inertial or not? Maybe I can zoom out a little bit because the answer is there, or maybe it's not. Okay. So by definition, an inertial reference frame has no acceleration. So by looking at velocity is constant or not, it keeps it smooth without force. We need to check mass. Okay, we will come to con concept of mass. That's what I'm trying to arrive at. But like, uh, but really like, how do you know if you are in a, inertial reference frame. Do you have like a reliable test of knowing this? 
the way you tell is like if you you check Newton's first law, right? If Newton's first law is valid, that's an inertial reference frame. What do we mean by that? So if an object at motion stays at motion, like say you release, you just put something at rest and observe it. If it stays at rest no matter what, obviously there's no force and there's no um, acceleration, so it's an inertial frame. Or it could be moving with constant velocity, you just observe it and you say, okay, Newton's first law is good here, then this is an inertial reference frame. So um, also just to make sure, if a reference frame is not inertial, you call it non-inertial and these frames generally are uh, under some force or they're under some acceleration, okay? So now, okay, we can talk about, so we talked about inertia and like Newton's law. So we can uh, also introduce the concept of mass. So for, of course, the question is what is mass? And I think Newton's answer to that was mass is amount of matter in a substance. I think we don't have a definition like this because definition of mass is the amount of inertia. So we talk about inertia. We said, okay, it's how much you want to move. So we just tie this concept to uh, mass and amount of inertia in an object is defined to be mass. What this means is the more mass you have, the more force you require or the harder for you to move, right? But inertia is the kind of like a resistance to movement. So it's, we measure this with mass. And in the SI units, mass is measured in kilograms. So here, just to clarify, uh, is a question for you. What is the difference between mass and weight? Are they same or different? Weight is a force, gravity. One is vector maybe. Mass is scalar. These are, I think, all correct. I, I think I, I kind of see you guys not. So mass is a universal property of matter. Your mass on Earth is the same as your mass on the moon or any other planet. Whereas weight depends on your location. For example, your weight on the moon is like, 12 times less than your weight on Earth, I think. So like you just wrote, weight is, I think there's like gravitational constant. It's like the force between two masses. Um, so this is important to distinguish. So mass is also, it's correct. Mass is a scalar. So it's just a number, if you like, um, quantifying the object at hand. So I think now we are ready to uh, introduce Newton's law of second law of motion. So, but okay, I think just to make sure, let's just uh, do some more observations. First, imagine you're moving with constant velocity V, which may or may not be zero. And suppose there's like a force acting on you like this in the same direction with the movement. Suppose you are driving, right, with constant speed and you press your gas pedal and somehow whatever happens, your car creates a force in the same direction. So what happens? What happens is your velocity increases, right? You experience an acceleration. Uh, so that's good, we are all familiar with this. So suppose you're again going with constant velocity like this, and now there's like an opposite force, like opposite to the direction of motion. Like you're in, again going in your car, you're just pressing the brakes, whatever happens, the wheels stop, the wheels stop spinning and there's friction at the end, 
there is a force like this. And what happens? What happens is this V decreases. So you experience a deceleration. Also, you can do something like this. Like you are driving again with constant velocity and you experience a force like this. Maybe the wind blows. And if you have ever driven, you can feel it in your um, steering wheel, right? What would happen? And what would happen if it was like a ideal world? You would, of course, this was, this was constant. This would not change, but you would slowly create a perpendicular component and you would try, you would try to go this way. So from these simple observations, I think I like to go through first the verbal statement of Newton's law. So verbal statement is like just an um, expression of these observations. First, acceleration is in the same direction with the force. So what we said was force is a vector, acceleration is a vector, and Newton's first law says acceleration and force are in the same direction. So for a vector, we just need magnitude and the direction. So we are good to direction. What about the magnitude? Here's the second law. Acceleration is proportional to the magnitude of the force. The greater the force is, the bigger the acceleration. And finally, we talk about inertia and mass. So acceleration or the magnitude of acceleration, if you like, is inversely proportional to mass. So the more mass is, the less the acceleration. And I think here's the equation for this. I think I know you all know this. And this is a notation from your book. So this is Greek sigma. That means net force, sum of all forces. F is a vector force is equal to M times A. M is the mass and A is the acceleration vector. So you can look at its components like this. If F is like a, you know, if you decompose F in terms of unit vectors, I hat, J hat, K, K hat, and A like this, you will find that in each direction, Newton uh, law of motion is valid. Like Fx is equal to M A X and so on for Y and Z. So here, um, just to repeat, in SI units, unit of force is Newton. If you find yourself looking for Newton, Newton, you can just use this equation. And the unit one Newton means one kilogram times meter per second square. Okay, so maybe we can solve this problem real quick just to check if you understand everything and then maybe we can give a break. Okay, so what average net force is required to bring a 1500 kilogram car to rest from speed of 100 kilometer per hour within a distance of 55 meters, okay? So this is your car with your inside and suppose this is the speed and you want to stop within 55 meters. How? do you calculate the amount of force you need? So you just want to apply Newton's second law. I think you can already tell this is uh, about one of our favorite equations. So V squared is equal to V naught squared plus 2A X minus X naught. Actually, since we have Newton's law, I think Newton's law, second law of motion is our favorite equation. So this is probably the uh, second most favorite, at least for me. So this is 55 meters because I want to stop. So this one, I don't know yet. I want to find. This one, V naught is 100 kilometer per hour, but this is not SI unit. So we have to convert 100 kilometer per hour is equal to 100 times 1000 meters divided by 60 minutes times 60 seconds. 
Okay, these guys are gone. And a thousand divided by, let's see, a thousand divided by 36, 2.78, 2.78. Meter per second. So this is 2.78 meter per second. And when it is at rest, this one is zero. I think I can solve this for A is equal to minus. Did I solve it right? Okay, I think that's right. Okay. 27, sorry, 27.8. I was like, this is a little bit too small. So this is 27 meter per second. So A is equal to minus two, okay, it's minus 27.8 squared, meter squared per second squared divided by two times five, five meter. Okay, these meters are cancel. So this guy's, let's take the square is equal to this, divided by two, this, divided by 55. Okay, this one is 7.0 meter per second square, but we are looking for force. So now we can use our favorite equation. Total force is equal to M times A. M is 1500 times 7.0. Okay, this is kilogram meter per second square. So this is times is equal to 10,521. This is 10,521 kilogram meter per second square. Of course, this is, we just said Newton. And like some, okay, there's actually a, actually a minus, minus, I forgot from this here because it's a deceleration, it's in the opposite direction to the motion. And if you want to fix it, I think the correct significant figure is something like this, but you know this better than I do now. Okay. Yes. Great. So I think we can move on. So now, okay, this was just a quick practice about Newton's first law. So um, the Newton, Newton's laws, let's go through the Newton's last and third law of motion. Uh, I think this is also important. And it goes like this, um, when an object applies a force on another object, there is an equal and opposite force acting on the first object by the second object. I think you guys are probably in, more familiar with that statement. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And I think there are a lot of examples of this too. For example, you in front of your computer or your screen, you can think if you have like wheels like I do right now, and if you think of forcing yourself like this, if you apply force on the table, right? You start moving a little bit back but the force is in this direction. So what happens? So what happens is you, the table exerts an equal and opposite force on you with the chair, so you start moving. Or if you are swimming, for example, what you do is like you put your arms and you push some amount of water back like this, but the water pushes you forward because of Newton's third law of motion. So you start moving. And I think there are a lot of examples, like if you are like in a rocket or this rocket, you can see there's like some gas and it ejects the gas by pushing it outside like this. 
and this ejected gas pushes the rocket system up like this. And if you are in a bike, you can apply some torque and then whatever happens, this wheel applies a force on the road in that direction. Like if you want to know the direction of the force, imagine there's like a paper under your wheel and you spin quickly, what happens? That paper will be ejected in that direction, right? That means there's like a force by the bike on the floor on this direction. But by Newton's third law, the road must be acting with an equal and opposite force. And that is the force that moves the bike when you're biking. Okay. There are many examples and I think it's important to identify these uh, pairs in specific problems. Here, uh, I want to introduce this notation and I want to give another example. Okay, let's erase this. So it is like this, I think in the past we introduced a notation like this, V A B is like a similar thing, but for force. So for force, we use of course F and the object that experienced the force, let's call it A, is shown with the first subscript and object which acts the force is shown by the second subscript. subscript. It's like force on A by object B, right? That's our notation. Sometimes it's useful to keep that notation faithfully to avoid some mistakes. And here's an elegant statement of Newton's third law, F a B is equal to minus F B A. So I think we can talk about this problem. Let me see. And we can continue later. So here is an example from your book. Third law clarification. Michelangelo's assistant has been assigned the task of moving a block of marble using a sled. And he says to his boss, I guess it's Michelangelo, when I exert a forward force on the sled, the sled exerts an equal and opposite force backwards. So how can I ever start it moving? No matter how hard I pull, the backwards reaction force always equals my forward force. So the net force must be zero. I will never be able to move this load. So is he correct? So what would you say to him? So he's basically saying, whatever force I put on the sled, the sled is giving an equal and opposite force to me. So the sum is zero. So there should be no movement. What do you say to this guy? He needs to beat friction, pull harder. But if he pulls harder, the sled will pull harder too. That's Newton's third law. So it's still zero it will eventually move. But whatever force there is, there's always an equal and opposite force and they will sum up to zero. So the total force is zero. There is only one force. Use some devices. Suppose there is no friction, okay? I mean, there must be a friction between his feet, but imagine he is moving like without a problem and there's no friction. We can talk about friction separately. But just to make sure this problem is not about friction, let's ignore the friction for the sled. Uh, professor, this is without friction, right? Can you say it again? Uh, this is without friction, the question. Without that. friction for the sled, yes. Third law, right? For every action, there's a reaction and they sum up to zero. But now the pro problem is the total force is zero. How do we reconcile with the second law, because the second law says total force is equal to m times a. Now, if the total force is zero, which is zero, we ignore the friction for the sled, because whatever he pulls, the sled will pull back, total force is zero. So then a should be zero and there should be never a movement. And then, so they are on different objects. Yes, that's the key, right? pairs, so sometimes we can forget about this. So it's important to remember that action and reaction pair are acting on different objects. 
And I think this is what your book is trying to highlight with this example. I mean, the assistant is pulling the flat sled, force on sled exerted by the assistant here is this, it's acting on the sled. But the reaction force, which is the force on the assistant by the sled, these are acting on different objects. So yes, they sum to zero, that's not a problem, but they act on different objects. So you cannot just sum them up and say that it's zero force in total on the sled or zero force on the assistant. Okay. So I think your book goes a little bit beyond that and talks about friction, blah, blah. But I think upshot of this problem is that uh, action reaction pairs are acting on different objects. Maybe I can write it like this. So I don't know, maybe I can action reaction pair acts on different objects, even though their okay, sum is zero, okay? Actually, their sum doesn't have a physical meaning, but I think we got the point. So, so let me introduce one more thing. Uh, maybe I will do it quickly and we can take a break for five minutes. So another, um, I think some of you already uh, pointed out, now we can talk about weight and weight is the force of gravity. And from the weight, there's like a normal force, okay? So for example, free fall is a motion with constant acceleration. And for this constant acceleration, there must be a force. And this force is due to pull from uh, the gravitational field. And we generally show it like this. Fg, gravitational force is m times g. It's generally down, but this means it's towards the center of the earth. And g is, we generally take 9.8 meter per second square. So when, so the, there's like one, Remark here, I think we should just go through. Gravitational force is acting even when objects are not moving. So of course, if, if, if we see a free fall, we know it's from the gravitational force, but even if something is standing on the table, like my bottle here, it's not moving, but it doesn't mean it doesn't experience the gravitational force. There's still gravitational force. And the point is that there must be an equal and opposite force to stop it from moving, right? Because it's not moving. And we call this the normal force. Basically, here's the example. Delete this. Here's the example. Look at this statue. The statue experiences gravitational pull. It's standing on the table, but obviously it's not moving. If it's not moving, total force must be zero, but there must be another force and that force is actually the normal force. The force, the contact force, if you like, by the table on the statue. And if you, just to make sure it's different from the uh, action reaction pair, there's actually an action reaction pair here. So this contact force is on the statue by the table and the statue actually pushes the table with an equal and opposite force like this. And to make sure it's acting on different object, I think your book is showing it with F n prime. Okay, here is a question and then we can go for a break. So the action reaction prime of this normal force is this, how about the action reaction pair of this gravitational force? So the gravitational force on statue is Fg. Where, where is its action reaction pair? Yes, so basically there is like earth here. Okay, earth. And earth is experiencing the same. So if this is the force by earth on the statue, 
is that you must pull the earth with an equal and opposite force. Okay, should we draw both of the action reaction pair on the free body diagram? Um, I think we will go through some examples. Sometimes you have to identify them and you have to draw them in free body diagrams. Yes, but the important thing is you cannot have action and reaction on the same free body, right? If you have separate free bodies, yes, you can see one action for C and one reaction for there. But if you find yourself drawing these pairs on the same body, then you should check your mistake. Now, I want to go with some examples. Do I have, I think I have, the rest of the class is mostly, I think all examples. And once we are done with examples, I think maybe I can also go through some suggested problems. But let's start with this. Um, so this is example six from your book. A friend has given you a special gift, a box of mass 10 kilogram with a mystery surprise inside. The box is resting on the smooth frictionless horizontal surface on a table, like here in the figure. Determine the weight of the box and the normal force exerted on it by the table. Okay. So what is the weight of the box and what is the normal force exerted on it? Okay, I already have some answers. So let's go ahead and start. So, okay. Sometimes uh, maybe I can advertise a little bit strategy for you. Sometimes problems may look at look really stupid to you. And then I think this is one of those stupid looking problems. But believe me, when you find yourself um, uh, struggling with a problem, try to go with the simplest thing. You know, simplest problems, at least my experience, help me better than these complicated examples. You can go for this hard problem that nobody can solve and then you know solve it. But really, to in a real life situation, you always look for simple problems and simple problems uh, generally expose like physical uh, phenomena better. So do not look down and say, this is stupid. I think try to try to see the value, even in simple problems. So here, yeah, I think it is simple, but it is going to show us all what we need. So weight of the box first. Okay, this is the box. Maybe I can use red. And there's like a MG, right? And the weight, so maybe I can put it A, F, W is basically M times G. M is 10.0 kilogram times G is 9.8 meter per second square. Like exactly like you said, it's like 98.0 Newton, okay? And the normal force exerted on it by the table. And the normal force, okay, the force on the box is like this. So they are in contact in this blue surface. So, and there's like a force by the box on the floor, right? I don't know, I can call it like F N prime, like your book says, but there is an equal and opposite force. And to make sure it's acting on the box, I'll put it in the center of mass of the box like this. So this is F N. And since the box is not moving, Fn is equal to minus 98.0 Newton. And like we suspected, the, they sum up to zero because there, there's no other force and the box is not moving. So you can see Fw plus Fn is zero here. Now B. Now your friend pushes down on the box with a force of 40 Newton as in figure, okay. There's no figure, but I think 
I remember they were pushing like this in the picture. Again, maybe I can put it on the other side. Some people may miss what I said. So a picture, maybe like a hand like this. Okay. Okay, pushes down, three fingered hand. And it says, this is like 40 Newton. Determine the normal force exerted on the box by the table. Okay, what about now? And I think I'll just go through, not to, so this 40, let's put it in the center of mass to make sure it's acting here. So this is 40, F, let's call this person. And if there is this extra force, of course, this is going to affect the normal force here. Uh, so that's basically, but maybe I can write it like this. FW plus F person plus F normal should be zero. You know, this didn't change. This is 98.0 Newton. This one is 40 Newton. And we are looking for this. So Fn is now what? Um, 138.0 Newton, right? Okay, hopefully I didn't do anything wrong. See if your friend pulls upward on the box with a force of 40 Newton, what now? Okay, so this is B, I think I can copy this. And now your friend is not pushing it down, but pulling it up. Let's delete this. Maybe I can clear, try to clear the clutter. Okay, now the force is okay. Like this, F person. And in this case, C, so, Fw plus Fp plus Fn is again zero. <coughs> so this is again 98.0 Newton. This is minus 40.0 Newton. And we are looking for this. And I think Fn in this case is minus 50, I guess. Maybe minus 48. Zero Newton. Okay. Good. A 65 kilogram woman descends in an elevator that briefly accelerates at 0 0.20 G downward. She stands on a scale that reads in kilograms. During this acceleration, what is her weight and what does the scale read? Okay. What is the weight and what does the scale read? I'll give you, let's say, two minutes. Or maybe I until some people write answers. Okay, I have answers. I have another answer. Thank you. Good. I have one more answer. And what does the scale read? And the elevator is descending with acceleration. Okay, maybe I can go ahead and there are some answers. So, okay, let's start. So like in the diagram, here is the free body diagram, if you like. So the woman is pulled down by gravity by mg and she's only in contact with the floor or maybe with the scale, which is standing on the floor. So there's the normal force on the woman by the scale. And there's no other force. And total acceleration is given A, right? So let's do A. So let's use Newton's notation or your book's notation. Total force 
is equal to M times A. Total force is MG minus FN. Now I know the direction, so I just want to look at the magnitudes. And this is equal to M and A is given. This guy is what? 0.2 G. 0.2, okay, this times G. And we are looking, okay, what is her weight? I think I skipped that step, right? Let's pull this down. F weight is obviously Mg, and this is 65 kilogram times 9.8 meter per second square, which is equal to 65 times 9.8. Is yes, 637. Oh, maybe I did something. 65 times 9.8. 637 Newton. So then here, um, that's right. So this equation F n is then equal to 0.8 mg, which is equal to times 0.8, 509. I think I can say this 510 Newton. Okay. So this is uh, the force. And I want to find this reading on scale. I think, what's our rate, what does it? Okay, scale obviously reads, um, scale obviously reads, I think in kilograms, right? I actually, the problem doesn't ask this, but we can convert this to reading in terms of kilogram. And I think at least my scale, at home reads in kilogram, not in Newtons. So for this, I can divide this by 9.8 and see she's gonna see 52 kilograms. So this guy, just to make sure this is 52 kilograms, okay? In Earth or in G is equal to 9.8 meter per second square. So B, what does the scale read when the elevator descends at constant speed of two meter per second square? I think this is simple. So B, constant speed. And we know now, I mean, the net force should be zero. So this Fn should balance this Mg, then we know it's going to be this. So the reading, so in this case, Fn or the reading on the scale is 637 Newton, which is woman's weight, which is 65 kilogram in G is equal to 9.8 meter per second, okay? So why did we use 9.8 meter per second square? Why calculating top line? The elevator is accelerating downwards. So, oh, okay, that's a good point. Thank you. So, for the top line, it's asking the weight, right? The weight is defined to be mg. And mg is mg, whether you are, so, so when apple is falling, it's still experiencing the same mg. Or if it's sending on the table, it's still experiencing the same mg. Or if you are running on the ground, you are still experiencing mg. So that's what we call weight. Your motion doesn't affect your weight, right? This is m times g. And m is universal. 65 kilogram is 65 kilogram anywhere in the universe. And 9.8 is, we are assuming this elevator is on Earth. So we multiply these two. In the second part, 
we say that, okay, the acceleration is down and 0.2 G. So we need to calculate the total force on the woman and total force is this Mg down plus this Fn up. And that's how we find Fn, okay? Okay. Suppose a friend asks you to examine the 10 kilogram box you were, you were given previously, hoping to guess what's inside. And you respond, sure, pull the box over to you. Then she pulls the box by the attached cord, like in the picture, along the smooth surface of the table. The magnitude of the force exerted by the person is Fp is equal to 40 Newton and it's exerted at an angle of 30 degrees angle as shown. Calculate A, the acceleration of the box, and B, the magnitude of the upward force Fn exerted by the table on the box. Assume there is no friction. So this is a little bit geometry, right? In A, we want to calculate the acceleration of the box. And here we can decompose this force. There's like, this component and this component, let's call this F, P, Y, and F, P, X. And I can calculate F, P, X is equal to F, P times cosine 30. And F, maybe I can keep the angles, but that's fine. Y is equal to Fp times sine 30, right? And the net force along this direction, which is the direction of movement, is, okay, let's write Newton's law. F along x direction is m times ax. If you like, sometimes I'll write this, sometimes I won't, but that's fine. And Fp times cosine 30 is equal to m times a. a is fp times cosine 30 divided by m. If you calculate this, 40, okay, what is this? Let's see, 40 times 30, maybe I can do it the other way. 30 cosine times 40 is equal to this, divided by 10, 3.4. 3.5, something like that. So this is what you found, let me see. Yeah. Yeah, around the same, yes. So maybe your answer is more accurate because it seems like they have two significant figures here. Maybe I will write it this way. 40, what was this? 46. Okay, so this is one. So this is, this is the acceleration. The magnitude of the upward force Fn exerted by the table on the box. So for B, I think there's no motion along this direction. So the total force must be zero. If you like, I'll do it like F. Y is equal to zero. And for that, I have this mg and there is this f normal and there is this pull f person y so mg plus no uh, f p y plus Fn is equal to zero and Fn is equal to minus mg, right? 
um, plus maybe I can just calculate it F P Y which is equal to 90 eight plus 40 times sine theta. I think that's one half. This is equal to minus 98 plus 20, which is minus 78. So what this means is uh, I happen to take th this direction positive. Sorry, this direction positive, I shouldn't have actually, but that's fine. And this is now Newton. Okay. So a small mass M hangs from a tin string and can swing like a pendulum. You attach it above the window of your car as shown in this figure. When the car is at rest, the string hangs vertically. And what angle theta does the string make when the car accelerates at constant A is equal to 1.2 meter per second square. And when the car moves at constant velocity, V 90 kilometers per hour. So I'll give you again a few minutes and I'll solve it, okay? Okay, we have multiple answers, so I assume that must be the case. So let's do this. Okay, when you move, I think our experience from driving says that it's gonna be like this. Right, and it's at angle theta, and there is like acceleration a, and there's guess m g. There is like t. So let's do this. A total force along x is equal to m times a x. So this one is, you can see t sine theta is equal to m times a. And let's also write total force along y direction is zero then let's take this one mg minus mg plus t cosine theta is zero then maybe i can solve this equation for t and plug it into here to find the answer so t is mg divided by cosine theta and I put it in the other one mg divided by cosine theta is equal to okay there's also a sign I forgot sine theta is equal to m times a so these guys are gone so so sine theta divided by cosine theta is tangent. Tangent theta, I think is equal to A over G and theta is equal to inverse tangent A over G. And this is what, let's see, clear. 1.2 divided by 9.8 is equal to this and inverse tangent is 6.98. I think yes, 6.98 degrees, okay. And B, I think most of you got this, so I'll move on. I think when car moves at constant velocity, acceleration is zero, and this theta must be zero, right? Okay, I will move on. Kilometer per hour. 
constant. Okay, a box slides down an incline. A box of mass M is placed on a smooth frictionless incline that makes an angle theta with the horizontal as shown in this figure. Determine the normal force on the box, determine the box acceleration and evaluate for MS M and incline theta, okay? I'll give you a couple of minutes. So, okay, so what are the forces? So I can identify first this guy, MG, right? Um, <clears throat> it has two components. One is like this. The other one is like this. And this is normal force. And so since this angle is theta, this angle is also theta. And actually this is, I can do this like, maybe I can use the notation. So this is X direction, this is Y direction. So this is F weight Y if you like. And this is F, maybe I can just use F, rotational headaches. This is FX, this is FY, and there's this normal force, FN, okay? So we can do, determine normal force on the box, A. So FN plus F, y is zero, fy I can see is m g cosine theta. So if you are confused, it's always the closest side is cosine and fn is minus. Actually, if we take this side, uh, this direction is positive in your book. So I'll actually write this one minus. So this is minus, then Fn is mg cosine theta. And if you calculate that, oh, I can, it's, it doesn't ask us to calculate now, we can do it later. And we need to determine box acceleration. So for that, okay, this is, yeah, let me clean this up, this is, sum of Fy is equal to zero, sum of Fx is equal to M times A, X, but I will not put X here, maybe I can put, but not later. Actually, I'm not gonna put it. So this is M, G, I think this is sine theta is equal to M times A. This guy is gone. Then A is equal to G sine theta. Evaluate for mass 10 kilogram and incline. Okay. If this is, I think, B, this is C, M, I should, M is equal to, I think, what was it? 10 kilogram. Okay and theta is equal to 30 degrees, okay? A is 9.8 times sine 30. I think this is one half, that must be 4.9 meter per second square, right? And Fn is equal to nine, Point eight. Okay, maybe I can put the ten first. Ten times nine point eight times cosine thirty. Let's do this. Ten times nine point eight times 
Oh, I think I took first 30 cosine times 10 times 0.8, 84. 84 Newton, okay. Seems like that's it. So I think I'll end here.